Good morning, everyone. Well, I've had fun filming. We had to do some pickups today, meaning we had to go shoot some scenes that we didn't get. So, it's a lot of fun. So, I'm just, I'm getting back. I've got to record this before we have a major storm hit which is coming in. It's probably about an hour or two away and it's coming in so we'll get this done ahead of time. So this is once again I am actually recording from my studio here in my tent camping and this is looking out the other window. I did one looking out that way now I'm looking out this way and it's not too bad. I may need to get a couple more lights in here because I'm still seeing as I turn away, I get the, the glare from my, say, from my face. Once I get some sun on my face a little bit more, if it stops raining, then I'll have enough tan that maybe this won't do that. Okay, so we've talked about, in the past I have talked about, God going out of his way to help somebody. We learned about him going out of his way to help the woman at the well, a Samaritan woman, second-class citizens to the Jews, they were a little bit to the north. We have the old parable about someone not, you know, people not wanting to stop and help a Samaritan. The good Samaritan parable. If you look at when he healed people, there's one thing I never thought about until I was working on this. We don't, for the most part, don't really hear about these people afterwards. Someone who's never walked. Pick up your bed and walk. He sends him on his way. Now he's in town telling everybody, and he's telling the religious leaders, even after he was told not to, but what do he do for a living afterwards? He only knows how to beg. Hopefully he was able to get up a real job. Hopefully God picking people to heal knew what their nature was like and that they would do better healed. When someone asked, you know, who sinned, the, the man you healed or his parents or his parents' parents? And Jesus said, nobody sinned to bring this here. This was here for a reason, but the reason is for the glory of God. So you'd see me healing him. So we don't always know why people are the way they are, why they're in a situation where they're at. That was a fish jumping behind me in the lake. There it goes again. So, God goes out of his way to help people. And when I wrote that down, I kind of chuckled because if you're omnipresent, how do you go out of your way to help somebody? Figure of speech. Okay. So let's look at a case, another case, where we've got Bible backup of God helping somebody. Stopping them, essentially redirecting them, and then taking over and helping him to do his ministry. And that would be Saul. Saul is his Hebrew name. Paul is his Greek name. He's still, got, he's still the same name. And he's basically still the same purpose. But when Jesus came to him on the road to Damascus, which is north Syria, we'll read it here in a bit, but he goes, why are you persecuting me? You hear the fish jumping. Saul was very zealous. He was a Pharisee. He had learned the Bible, and he thought he was protecting it. He was very adamant about protecting it, but he was re protecting it from the wrong direction. Once Jesus convinced him that he was who he said he was, then Saul, Paul, flipped 180 and now was just as zealous to help the Christians along the way. He was a right man, but he had the wrong instructions. 
So turn with me to Acts, let's see, Acts 9, 1. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. <coughs> he was just a worker, a worker bee. He was a scribe, but he was, you know, a Pharisee and a scribe type. But he was one of the workers. He had to go get permission from the high priest. And he asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus. It's a relatively small community, even though the distance, you might, you know, take a few days to walk it. They didn't have transportation like we do. It might only take a few minutes now if you could go there. But in any case, the bottom line is he wanted letters to take to them to give him the authority to arrest people. As for letters to him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, they weren't called Christians initially. They were of the way, the one way, the only way. However you wanted to interpret what they were saying, there's only one way to heaven, so they were the way. For the men or women, he might bring them bound, tied up, handcuffed, hogtied, hanging from your wrists and your feet on a stick. He didn't care. They were going against his religion. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus. He was almost there. And suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So who is he persecuting? Jesus. And Saul, realizing that the average person couldn't do this, says, and he said, who are you, Lord? He didn't know who he was, but he knew he was powerful enough to be a the Lord. And the Lord said to him, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the gourds. Figure of speech again, but you're fighting me in the wrong direction. Stop it and I'll get you on the right direction. So he, Paul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? How often are we in a situation where we've been stopped mid-tracks doing something that we shouldn't be doing, thinking we're right, and then get mad at God for stopping us? And we're all indignant. How could you possibly do this? I'm trying to help you. He doesn't need our help. He wants our help, but he doesn't need it. What do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. This next step required faith. But he's blinded. So there's a problem. And the mid who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. God was able to let them hear. That's, that's God. And Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one, but they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. So he was blinded from the bright light. Because they were there, they just, they're going to lead him, but he couldn't see. And he was three days without sight, and he neither ate nor drank. He's a religious official that I'm sure was used to fasting. And he knew that something like this required fasting. It's important. In 9.10, Ananias baptizes Saul. It's not required to get to heaven. But if you're consciously working with the Lord, you should be baptized to show the world that you've made a decision. Again, it's not necessary. If you've never been baptized, 
It's not going to keep you from heaven, but if you get the opportunity, I would take it because we're being obedient to God when you do that. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight. So there's a, a street called Straight. And inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. Tarsus is a Roman colony. For behold, he is praying. So it tells him where to find him. The towns weren't that big. It's sort of like going to Main Street or First Street. You know, it's right downtown. It's, you don't have to go out in the countryside looking for him. And in 12, verse 12, And in a vision he had seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. So they're each one being updated. God's making sure they know what's going on. Then Ananias answered him and said, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. He had been doing this for so long, everybody knew who he was. And they were afraid of him. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. Doesn't take much for word to get around about this stuff. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. He's a Jew, but he's going to the Gentiles, the kings, and lastly, the children of Israel. He's the one that started our church age or our Gentile age. And Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. See, he hasn't been filled yet. In the baptism, he hadn't been filled yet. It's something that you've got to do, but John the Baptist was baptizing people before Pentecost, before Jesus. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like a scale, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. Is that two baptism, or did I just read that wrong earlier? I've read this thing through three times as I was preparing it, and that just dawned on me. Ah, uh, okay. Sometimes I, the Bible I've got puts headings at the chapters, at the top of the chapters, if there's something unique. And it says, Ananias baptizes Saul. Okay. So that's what the chapter's about. So he hadn't been baptized yet. Okay. Getting ahead of myself. But I wanted to make sure I got that right. And... Immediately, that's okay. So we have disciples at Damascus. Okay, then Saul spent some days with the disciples. After he'd been baptized, he received food. He was strengthened. Then he spent some days with the disciples in Damascus. Saul preaches Christ immediately. He preached Christ in the synagogues, that he was the Son of God. Oh, I'm sure they loved that. And all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not the one who destroyed those who called on the name, or destroyed those who called on, on the name in Jerusalem, on his name? He has come here for that purpose, so that he might bring them bound to the chief peace, priests. I mean, everybody in town knew what he was doing. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. Saul was a Pharisee, well trained in the Bible, Old Testament of course. He's a writer of the New Testament, but 
they don't have these letters passed around yet. So he knows Judaism. So when Jesus, through the Spirit, teaches him about his references in the Old Testament, Saul could then do that. Jesus loved the quote from Isaiah. It talked about him all the time. The Pharisees were a particular sect of the SECT, sect of the religious leaders of the Jews. There were two main sects. There's some little ones, but two main ones, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And for all practical purposes, they were the guardians of the knowledge. The di main difference was is that the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. They believed on everything else pretty much, but they didn't believe in that. So there was no way that they were going to be able to accept Christ because he was resurrected. But Paul, being a Pharisee, they believed in the resurrection. So he was the right one of the religious leaders to grab. Nicodemus, what must I do to be born again, was a Pharisee. They were friends. They knew each other. So, like the, okay, so uh, what have I got here? Reading a little bit about Pharisees were members of a party that believed in resurrection and were following legal traditions that were ascribed not to the Bible, but to the tradition of their fathers. I've said this all along. Most religious leaders stopped looking at the Bible and only looked at the crib notes, the Talmud and the Mishnah and a couple other ones. But the priests of the days throughout history put their comments in of what certain things meant. Sometimes they were wrong. Sometimes there's more in the scripture than in their commentary, but people didn't go back to the scripture. Traditions of their fathers. Like the scribes, they were also well-known legal experts. Hence the partial overlap of membership Pharisees, the scribes, and the Sadducees. The scribes were basically the ones that wrote the documents, but they could be either one of the other ones too, and a scribe. Basically, someone who was taught to read and write. Okay, how are we doing on time? Yeah, we're good. Okay, so Paul. God went out of his way because he knows where we're going. He knows every name written in the Book of Life, even if you're not in it yet. Now you say, well, how is this is predestination? No. You can spend your entire life away from God and turn to him at the last second. Ask the thief on the cross. You will have potentially a miserable life, a life without God. But he will let you do that, knowing that you're going to come to him at the end. So you have a choice, to follow God or not to follow God. We're going to see a lot of people choose not to follow God all the way to death. Those are the ones that we have to try to reach. If we can save one, that's another soul in heaven. And we'll be able to, I don't know if we're going to remember who we saved or who we not, I don't know. So if you see them on the street, they will come up and give you a hug. Or in heaven, if they see you walking around, they can come up and give you a hug and thank you again for saving them. It's the Spirit of God that does the work, but we're the, we're the agent, the tool. All right, I'm going to wrap this up so I can get it edited and uploaded before this massive storm comes in, because it will probably knock out my internet. Right now, I am doing recordings. I'm recording daily for the post the next morning. I'm working next Monday, so I will have to have two videos, one to cover Monday. And I don't know if I'm working any other days during the week. They could tack more on as they need them. And Saturday, I'm going to the Renaissance Festival. This is the opening weekend. 
and because I'm working at um, the TV series, I can't change my face, so I can't grow my beard and look like a member of the time. So I'm just going to basically, I'm just going in civilian clothes. It may be hot, so I'll do like I'm doing now. I've got a t-shirt on underneath this, sleeves are rolled up. I can take this off if I need to, if it gets too hot. Sometimes I'll do that in my costumes. I'll layer my costume. And at noon, I'll walk out to the car, take my costume, part of my costume off, and just leave on the under, underlying parts of it. I've got everything I need to do all this. I've been doing it for years. So it doesn't cost me anything. And sometimes I get free passes. It depends on whether I want to work or not. I have an open invitation to work, but if I'm, more, if I'm working in there, I'm not having as much fun as if I'm just simply walking around helping people and doing stuff. When I'm in costume, I've got little gold, I, mean, I go as a pirate most of the time. I've got little gold doubloon, the little aluminum, but painted gold, you know, so they look real, but they're fake. You hand them out to the kids, give them a gold doubloon. A lot of fun. All right. Enjoy the time that we have. We don't have a whole lot left. So enjoy it. The sense of being miserable all the way up till the end, that's not what God wants. And it's a sin to be miserable. You know that? Joy. Love, joy, peace, long suffering. See in the clouds. It's the morning after it rains. I've been watching fish jump. I don't know if I'll catch one for you. Picture, not the fish. The trees are still dripping. It's that fresh of a rain. Don't see. Well, there's one bird going to fly by. But because of the rain, they're all hiding out somewhere. I don't see our lone goose. There's one goose out here that damaged her wing. And she can't go flying with the rest of the flock. She just kind of stays here. She can get airborne for a little while, but she can't stay airborne. And that's a problem. There she is, way down there on the bank underneath that tree there. Got this back side over here. I see some birds on the far bank, but the only ones making noise are our crows. You need to get out and enjoy this while you can. <laughs> 